Good evening, visitors. Welcome to the Australian War Memorial's last post ceremony. My name is Joanne Smedley, and joining us today from the Royal Australian Navy is Commander Paul Logger. We warmly welcome the members of the Royal Australian Signals Association, including Major General Ian Gordon. The association is here to commemorate the service of all signalers who have served in the communications from the early beginnings in 1869 in New South Wales and Victoria as a small torpedo and signal corps, to service during the First and Second World Wars and the subsequent conferring of the title by His Majesty King George VI to become the Royal Australian Corps of Signals. Since that time, service in all operational areas, including Korea, Malaya, Borneo, Vietnam, Cambodia, East Timor and the Middle East. We thank you for your service. We welcome the veterans who have served, those that are still serving and the families that support them. We acknowledge the members of RSL and Services Clubs Association, RSL Victoria and RSL Queensland who are watching the broadcast of this ceremony across Australia. During this evening's ceremony, wreaths will be laid at the base of the Pool of Reflection by visitors. Please stand and join in the singing of the National Anthem. The Australian War Memorial was the vision of Charles Bean, Australia's First World War official historian. Bean landed with the Australian troops on Gallipoli and stayed with them at the front through to the end of the war. The idea of this national memorial and museum came to him at Pozieres, France, in the depths of the bloody fighting of 1916. Bean's idea was that this would be a place where families and friends could mourn loved ones buried in faraway places. It would also be a place that could help all Australians understand what these men and women had endured and what they had done for us. Bean's vision, to which we remain true, is best expressed as inscribed in the entrance to the memorial's galleries. Here is their spirit in the heart of the land they loved. And here we guard the record which they themselves made. Tonight we will read the story behind just one of those on the Roll of Honour which lists the names of more than 102,000 men and women who have given their lives for us in war and operations for more than a century. But first we present a lament, Flowers of the Forest. Wreaths or floral tributes will now be laid at the base of the pool of reflection.
Today, we remember and pay tribute to Signaler Maxwell Alfred William Benoit. Maxwell Benoit was born on the 26th of September, 1919 in Ballarat, Victoria, the son of Edmund and Elizabeth Benoit. Benoit's father died at a young age when he was 10 years old. His mother later remarried and took the surname Redding. Benoit went on to work as an electrical testman until he enlisted in the 2nd Australian Imperial Force on the 5th of June 1940, a few months before his 21st birthday at the Town Hall in Melbourne. Given his trade knowledge, Benoit was a perfect fit for signals. After some initial training, he was posted to the 8th Division Signals, embarking for overseas service on the 2nd of February 1941 and arriving in Singapore a few weeks later. Late in the month, Benoit was found absent without leave at Kuala Lumpur and was confined to barracks for two days as punishment. This started a pattern of discipline that would continue throughout the year. Benoit was again confined to barracks in April, this time for squatting on the ground while on sentry duty. In July, he was found absent without leave, having broken out of camp and failed to appear at the evening tattoo roll call. On this occasion, he was confined to barracks for two weeks and fined. In November, he was confined to barracks, to barracks for three days after being found guilty of neglecting to obey routine orders. With the Japanese quickly advancing down the Malayan Peninsula, parts of the 8th Division went into action for the first time in January 1942. The 2nd 29th Battalion was detached to assist an Indian Brigade and became cut off after heavy fighting. So the 2nd 19th Battalion was sent to assist. After fighting to regain contact with the Indians, the 2nd 19th began a fighting withdrawal towards the bridge at Parat Sulong. Arriving at the bridge, they found that it was firmly held by the Japanese. Benoit was a member of a three-man wireless detachment, which had gone forward to re-establish the situation before the group was overwhelmed. For five days, Benoit and his comrades were exposed to enemy fire and air attack. One was killed. Benoit was wounded three times and was suffering, but remained at his post, maintaining communication with force headquarters. During the attack, the transmission set that the group was using was wrecked. So they improvised another out of broken parts, reportedly at tapping two wires together to communicate using Morse code. When two shells fell near the wireless truck and damaged the set beyond repair, they destroyed the equipment. By now, the situation was desperate. Five trucks containing the wounded and clearly marked with the Red Cross were sent to try to pass the Japanese positions. The driver of the truck asked for the wounded to be allowed to pass, but the Japanese officer in charge demanded unconditional surrender. This was refused, but the officer did allow the wounded to return to camp. Fearing that the delay would prove too costly, the most seriously wounded were put in an ambulance with a volunteer driver and sent to cross the bridge at high speed. As it reached the other side of the bridge, the enemy machine gunned the ambulance, killing the driver, and the truck overturned in a ditch. With no hope of escape, the Allied force destroyed its vehicles and heavy equipment, left the remaining wounded to await medical attention from the Japanese. The other men formed small groups to avoid enemy positions, marching through the jungle to find Allied lines to the south. Benoit and another signaller became separated from the party and were listed as missing in action, but finally appeared around three days later. Benoit was awarded, awarded a military medal for his action, but would not live to receive it in person. With the fall of Singapore on the 15th of February 1942, Benoit became a prisoner of war. Initially confined at Changi, 
he was eventually assigned to F Force, one of the last labour forces to leave Changi in mid-April 1943. Many of the men were unwell before they left Singapore. Isolated in far up-country Thailand, remote from food and medical supplies, and drenched by monsoonal rains, almost a third of the Australians and two-thirds of the British prisoners would die. Air Force's hardships began when they were sent to Thailand by train. Packed into suffocating metal railway trucks with little food and water, those suffering from dysentery had few opportunities to relieve themselves. After reaching Bampoming, Thailand, Air Force would be forced to march over 300 kilometres to camps near the border with Burma, today's Myanmar. Benoit and two other men, Lance Corporal Clement Miller and signalman Eric Simons, planned to escape from a camp at Tiamonta around the 2nd of May, 1943. A survivor later recalled that Benoit thought he had at least a 50-50 chance of getting through to India and knew that he was likely to be shot if recaptured. None of the men were seen again. There were later reports that they had been executed and family rumours held that Benoit had been beheaded. But without firm evidence, all that could be done was to declare the three men presumed dead. Today, Maxwell Benoit is commemorated at the Singapore Memorial in Cranji War Cemetery, which bears the names of more than 24,000 casualties of the Commonwealth land and air forces who died during the campaigns in Malaya and Indonesia or in subsequent captivity and who have no known grave. His name is listed on the Roll of Honour on my left, among almost 40,000 Australians who died while serving in the Second World War. This is but one of the many stories of service and sacrifice told here at the Australian War Memorial. We now remember Signal and Maxwell, Alfred, William, Benoit, who gave his life for us, for our freedoms, and in the hope of a better world. Please stand for the reading of the ode and sounding of the last post. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Lest we forget. Lest we forget.
leave you this evening with the words of the memorial's founder, Charles Bean. Many a man lying out there at Pozier or in the low scrub at Gallipoli with his poor, tired senses barely working through the fever of his brain has thought in his last moments, well, well, it's over. But in Australia, they will be proud of this. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, that concludes the last post ceremony. Please feel free to visit the poppy display in the grounds as you leave. We thank you for visiting the Australian War Memorial and wish you all a very good evening.